Buenos a todos. That's the extent of my Spanish for today. Now, I know you have heard a lot about nasty viruses lately, like Ebola and dengue, and of course, we're just coming out of COVID. But today, I'm going to tell you about viruses that can be medicine. Now, I'm not just talking about any kind of virus. I'm talking about viruses that attack bacteria. Now, these are called bacteriophage, sometimes called phage for short. And in fact, in 2023, the World Economic Forum named phage therapy as one of the most promising technologies, number four of 10 in the world. So you're gonna learn about this today. Now, I didn't start off being an expert in phage therapy. I kind of came about it the hard way when a superbug hit my family. In fact, my husband and I were on vacation in 2015 in Egypt. He'd always wanted to see the Valley of the Kings. And we had this lovely meal on top of a cruise ship and he got violently ill. Like, I mean, he was tossing and turning and vomiting all night long and I was really quite annoyed with him until I realized that he was very sick. And he first got taken to a clinic in Luxembourg where our ship was based and they didn't like what they saw. Um, they said, wow, there's something going on in his abdomen. They stabilized him and they sent him to Germany. The photo on the right hand side is him in full PPE in Frankfurt, Germany. And there they diagnosed him with a gallstone that had stuck in his bile duct and caused a giant abscess the size of a small football. But that wasn't the worst of it, because inside that abscess lurked something called a superbug. Now, a superbug is a nickname for a bacteria that has developed resistance to multiple antibiotics. This one is one of the worst ones on the planet. It's called Acinetobacter bomanii. Oh, and when I learned this, I was really scared, and the doctors were too. And I realized that my husband was becoming one of these people in a post-antibiotic era because antibiotics are not working anymore. And pharmaceutical companies are getting out of the business of making new antibiotics. By 2050, one person every 10 seconds, that's 10 million people per year, will be dying from a superbug infection unless we do something drastic about it. But this is a story about good news. So that's some of the bad news. Now, how did we get into this mess? Well, it's because we have overused and misused antibiotics. In many countries, including the country I'm from, Canada, and the country I live in, the United States, over 70% of antibiotics are actually used in agriculture and animal husbandry, like feeding the same antibiotics to pigs and cows and chickens that we use in people for medicine. And when that happens, that breeds antimicrobial resistance genes that superbugs gobble up. So I started to do my homework here, and I realized that my husband was a lot sicker than I thought. In fact, he was medevaced or air ambulanced back to the United States. And this photo was taken four months after he entered the hospital. It, it is now my, my friends that were looking after him because we're based at the University of California, San Diego, and I'm in the Department of Medicine, although I'm not a doctor. And they said, Steph, he's not gonna make it. You know, this superbug is now resistant to all antibiotics, so they couldn't operate to take this abscess out. Instead, they put catheters or these drains in his abdomen, and they were like pouring out of him. He had five drains and a feeding tube, and this photo was taken the day that they told me that he wasn't going to make it. And so I had this conversation with him where I said, honey, I know you're in a coma, and I hope you can hear me, but I need to know if you want to live. And if you want to live, you need to fight like you've never fought before. And I will help you if I can, but you need to tell me. And so I waited and I said, squeeze my hand if you want to live. And about a minute later, he squeezed my hand really hard. And I got really excited and then I thought, oh crap, like what am I going to do? Like, you know, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, but I'm not a medical doctor. But I did what any of you would do. I went home and I started to do research on my own. And I found this paper 
written by some Spanish researchers, and it was on alternative treatments for antimicrobial resistant Acinetobacter baumannii. And buried in it was something called phage therapy. And a little bell in my head went ding, because I have a rusty old degree in microbiology from the University of Toronto. And I learned back then that phage are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. In fact, they have a strange history, and I can't get into it all today, but know that they've been discovered over 100 years ago, even before penicillin, the first antibiotic, was discovered. And this fellow on the right-hand side, um, his name is Felix Dejarel, and he deduced um, through an experiment that whatever was in this filtrate that was killing a bacteria must be smaller than bacteria because it passed through a Pasteur filter. And it was able to kill the bacteria in his Petri dish and he called it bacteriophage, and derived from the Greek meaning bacteria eater or devourer. Well, Felix went on to help the first phage therapy center become established in what is now Tbilisi, Georgia. And this was leading up to World War II, and Russia was the enemy. So unfortunately, phage therapy got this reputation of being Soviet medicine or Soviet science. And this geopolitical bias hung over the field for decades, and that's one of the reasons why the West forgot all about phage therapy. So let me tell you a little bit more about this. But, you know, of course, what happened too is penicillin came on the scene because World War II really required um, some treatments for troops that were dying on the field. Um, and phage were relegated to the back burner. Now, what they look like, and this is a scanning electron micrograph of a bacterium stained in orange being attacked by phage that are stained in green. Now, they look a little bit like alien spiders. I even have phage earrings on today that a patient gave to me. Um, but phage, we know, um, come in all shapes and sizes. In fact, there's 10 million trillion trillion phages on the planet as an estimate. And that's a nonillion for those of you that like numbers. Um, and they are very specific. They attach to a receptor on the bacterial cell and they drill into it and they take over the bacterium, turning it into a phage manufacturing plant. Now, um, if given the kill signal, those baby phage burst out and they go on to attack new bacteria, but only attack the bacteria that they're matched to. So unlike antibiotics, they just have this precision medicine. They just kill the bacteria that have the receptor that they attach to. So I got really excited and I thought, wow, I've done this crash course on phage therapy to get me back into the, you know, the 21st century. Can we use phage therapy to save Tom? Well, I turned to my colleagues at the University of California, San Diego, and they said, well, we're a teaching hospital. We're going to inv invest in cutting edge therapies, and Tom will die without something cutting edge. So why don't you try to find some phage that are a match for Tom's bacterium? So I went back to the literature, and you know, I realized, oh my god, this is worse than trying to find a needle in a haystack. What am I going to do? So I went back, and I found total strangers in the literature that were studying phage, and I wrote one of them, and this was, is, on the left is Dr. Rai Young, and he was a phage researcher who answered my prayer. He said, I'll turn my lab into a command center. If you send me his bacterium, I'll see if we can find matches. And he looked in some of the craziest places. The people on the right-hand side are actually like folks that put their whole experiments on hold. And the girl in the necklace was a PhD student and who slept in the laboratory. And she went through like samples from bogs and barnyards and sewage treatment facilities because that's where there's a lot of bacteria, right? So wherever there's a lot of bacteria, there is the perfect predator, the phage, that will kill them. So then another group got involved. This is even crazier, the US Navy. Because when my colleague, Dr. Schooley, who was going to oversee this protocol, called the FDA and said, you know what, this Texas A&M team has found phage matches to help us cure this patient who's a colleague of ours here in San Diego. And the FDA official said, well, the military is working on this. Maybe they could help too. So this is Lieutenant Commander Theron Hamilton, who looks like a dead ringer for Tom Cruise. And he turned to the phage whisperer, who's pictured on the, on the right-hand side, and he said, let's see if we can find matches too. So basically, they did what's called the plaque assay. You get a sample of sewage, you put it on a Petri dish that's streaked with your bacteria, you incubate it for 24 to 48 hours, and if it comes back looking like Swiss cheese, then you know 
know that that phage has gobbled up those bacteria get really excited. And so that's what they did. So both teams found phage that were a match. And within three weeks from my first email, we had a phage cocktail that the FDA had approved on a compassionate basis for patient who is dying, my husband. Now, this is what Tom looked like the day that phage therapy began. He was not like wiggling his eyebrows or squeezing anybody's hand anymore. He was like within hours of dying. It was the scariest moment of my life. But three days after we began phage therapy, he woke up, lifted his head off the pillow and kissed his daughter's hand. I mean, it was just an incredible experience. So he made a, an incredible recovery, and a year after he was cured, the phage whisperer presented his case at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, and after that, the story went viral, but in a good way, because patients all over the world who need this treatment were reaching out to me and Dr. Schooley and our colleagues, and they said, we want phage therapy too. Well, and we helped many of them, and... Um, in fact, our chancellor at UC San Diego gave us seed funding to start what became the first dedicated phage therapy center in North America, the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, or IPATH. And I co-direct this center now with Dr. Schooley, which is kind of weird. Now, it's not all been rosy. We've had some struggles, but we have been able to help patients with a whole host of variety of different types of infections. Some, which are shown on this slide, like urinary tract infections, lung infections, um, prosthetic joint infections, etc. And now we've seen a, a resurgence in clinical trials for phage therapy because that's what's going to be needed to usher this treatment into the wider scale because we have to show that it can work better or as good as antibiotics. And um, the first dedicated phage uh, treatment study um, as a trial that was funded by the NIH for intravenous treatment of phage began, um, and our, our center is involved in this, and it's now in the second phase. Also, the first genetically modified phage cocktail to be successfully used in a human was published in, in a paper in 2019. And this has gotten biotechs very interested because it's a lot easier to patent genetically modified phages. And what we're doing at our center in IPATH is building a phage library so that you don't have to go back to sewage or barnyard waste every time somebody's got an infection. If you have carefully characterized phages that are in a cooler or a walk-in fridge or freezer, then you'll be able to match phage to the bacterial isolate very quickly. And in fact, colleagues of mine in Brazil are doing just this because they're getting ready to open the first phage therapy center in South America. So stay tuned for that. Before I close, I do want to tell you that there are lots of different applications for phage therapy that are being uh, explored. Applications um, in veterinary medicine, um, using phage to disinfect wastewater or to um, respond to outbreaks or to replace antibiotics with phage in uh, agriculture and animal husbandry. And my husband and I were very um, blessed. You know, this is a terrible thing that happened to us, but to know that it saved lots of other people, we decided to tell our story. And that's why I'm talking to you today. We decided to write a book, The Perfect Predator, A Scientist Race to Save Her Husband from a Deadly Superbug. And of course, we've had all sorts of collaborators that have helped us save other patients' lives. And I have to thank a global village of people that have saved my husband's life. Um, I haven't even met all of them. But I do have a surprise for you today, because you, how do you know that I'm just not making this up, right? It could be all artificial intelligence, all these photos. But you know, I brought somebody very special today. My husband is sitting in the front row. Tom Patterson, stand up. <laughs> Muy guapo. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Seeing is believing. Fei Zhang.